Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Morning, everyone. I'm Doug. I'm alcoholic. Hi, Doug. Through the grace of God, actions, AA, and sponsorship, I've been sober since October 8th of 1989, for which I'm extremely grateful this morning. And, and I, I say that uh, because I was always taught uh, for my sponsor to give credit where credit is due, and it's simply because of those things, uh, the grace of God, the actions that I've taken in Alcoholics Anonymous and a sponsor that encourages me uh, to continue to take actions that I don't want to take is the reason I stand before you today. Okay, and and uh, no other reason than that. So, I am uh, sure glad to be here. I uh, want to thank uh, Alyssa for the opportunity to to participate. Um, the White House is uh, has been a big part of my recovery, and and I just think uh, I just uh, could have not even fathomed the idea when I walked in here 25 years ago of uh, being up here someday speaking at the White House conference on Sunday morning. So it is, uh, it's, it's just really a dream and, and just really grateful for the opportunity. So thank you very much. Um, I want to welcome you to Alcoholics Anonymous if you're new. Bar none, Alcoholics Anonymous is the greatest thing that's ever happened to me. And uh, it, uh, it is amazing um, that uh, uh, what is available to, uh, to all of us, if, uh, if we're willing to just simply grab on, uh, to what uh, what is the grace and recognize it and and uh, uh, just be open minded and and uh, uh, willing to take some different actions and and uh, I'll tell you um, I believe it's open to all of us if we're if we're all God's children then uh, uh, then everybody's uh, got the right to have it and and uh, uh, at some time uh, throughout uh, throughout uh, my recovery there early on, I'm glad that I recognized uh, uh, the grace and grabbed on. And, and I think uh, I think a lot of people um, just simply uh, come around Alcoholics Anonymous and, and they just don't recognize that. And eventually what happens is we run out of the opportunities that we're given. Okay? We just flat out run out of the opportunities and, and uh, uh, we end up burying people like that on a regular basis or they end up in some mental institution for the rest of their life or in prison for the rest of their life. And and uh, so I'm sure glad that uh, this last time I grabbed on to what seemed like such a flimsy read and, and uh, uh, turned out to be the loving hand of God. And, and uh, I, uh, I'm glad to see a lot of the uh, old timers here this morning um, that... Uh, that have uh, made this thing possible throughout the years. Great to see Al uh, this morning. Um, didn't get to see you this weekend. Jeff Harpin, Denny back there. Uh, many of the guys that uh, um, that are here and that have uh, paved the way for me and uh, have uh, continued to uh, to do what is necessary for uh, this White House to, to maintain where it is. Larry, um, enjoyed the speakers this weekend. Uh, it's just been uh, uh, been awesome and uh, great to hear Candace. Uh, I've not heard her, heard Mike, heard Jane before, and uh, I didn't get the opportunity to hear Kim, but uh, I'll listen to your CD, so uh, glad for that. Um, I'll tell you, I, uh, uh, I was a long ways from that when I was uh, growing up, and I uh, grew up in Johnston, uh, and I was... Uh, uh, down with my best friend, Martin, Martin and I were inseparable. We did everything together. And, uh, this day we were together. We were, uh, we were bored out of our mind. And, and I remember Martin saying to me, we'd done everything that day to entertain ourselves. And, and, uh, I remember Martin, he said, you want to make a Martin martini? And I said, what's a Martin martini? And he said, it's everything on that bar over there mixed together into one glass. And I remember we proceeded to get up and I grabbed every single bottle cause I wasn't going to miss out on anything poured it into that glass and stirred it up with a uh, swizzle stick like I'd seen my uh, uh, mom do and uh, proceed to drink that down. And what uh, what happened, I mean, that obviously tasted awful. It turned into this uh, purple pukey Kool-Aid color, and it uh, it looked awful and it tasted awful. And, and uh, But Martin was drinking his, and I wasn't going to let him show me up. And, and uh, what happened that day is I drank enough of that alcohol that the, the magic happened, which happens for all of us. 
okay, as, as uh, things begin to get real entertaining real fast. And uh, I remember we went outside and, and uh, we chased the, the dog around. We beat up the neighbor kid. And, and uh, um, Martin had a tree farm in his backyard. And I remember we went back there and we cut down a few young trees. And, and uh, that was my first experience with alcohol. And uh, if you're anything like me, Okay, you have a committee up inside your head that talks to you all the time, whether you want to hear it or not. So they're talking to you right now, right? And uh, that committee uh, took that situation and filed it under fun and alcohol for later use. And I grew up in Johnston. Uh, my dad left uh, when I was two and a half and, and uh, had never met him. And and uh, he uh, neither did he help my mom with uh, any kind of a, a child support or anything. He just was not around. And, uh, uh, my mom and I, and my brother, and, uh, we lived with, uh, uh, with my grandma and, uh, uh, my deaf uncle in Johnston. And, uh, my mom worked two or three jobs to raise my brother and I, she worked her tail off. And when she wasn't working, um, she rightly deserved some time for herself. And, and, uh, when she was off, she played hard and, uh, that left, uh, that left my grandma to take take care of my brother and I a lot. And, and I became very close to my grandma. I really related with uh, Candace's story because I was the type of kid that uh, at night I would, uh, I would, I would be scared and, and I would sneak down the stairs and I would go and sleep with grandma. And, uh, I would, uh, I would just, uh, uh, seek her warmth and comfort and, and, uh, was just, uh, um, comforted by her and uh just felt safe around her and and uh so um it was uh it was not uncommon for me to to be there every morning and uh in grandma's bed and uh my brother he was he was pretty ruthless he told me there was monsters under my bed and and uh you know <clears throat> i just was absolutely convinced that there was something under there going to get me so i would go to grandma's room and she nothing could could uh, hurt grandma i knew that so um but uh you know, I just, I always felt unique. I always felt different. I'd be down at uh, Martin's house and, uh, uh, Martin, uh, had a, he just had that family, you know, he had, and his dad was uh, just a great guy. He was a volunteer firefighter. And I just thought he was just a, an amazing guy. We'd be over at Martin's house and, and, uh, um, his dad would get a, a, a call and he'd come flying out of the house and put the, the siren on the hood of the car and, Man, he'd shoot out of there, and he he was on uh, on his way to go uh, help somebody, some kind of fire or accident or whatever the case might be. And I just thought, gosh, that's so cool. His dad is so cool. And and uh, um, but I would be down at Martin's house, and and uh, his uh, parents would say, Doug, it's time for you to go home. We're going to sit down and eat dinner. And uh, I would I would think to myself, gosh, I'm not going to go home and have a family dinner. Grandma's going to have something cooked up, but, but, uh, mom's going to be gone and, and, uh, I'm going to eat that and then I'm going to go back outside and play. And I just knew I was different. I just, I just felt different. Um, and I always felt like when I showed up to school, I, I, you know, I, you've heard it said a million times that you, you know, you somehow along the line, I showed up an hour late and wasn't given the instruction manual that day. And I just felt out of place. And I don't know about you, but when I'm, when I'm fearful and full of fear, typically what happens to me is I lash out in anger. Okay. And, and, uh, it was not uncommon for me in school, um, to, uh, the teacher would, would, uh, uh, you know, try to redirect me or, or say something. And, and, uh, uh, it was not uncommon for me to lash out in anger. It got so bad to the point where, uh, uh, the kids would start to uh, see the teacher say something and they would realize that I was starting to get angry and they would start to chant. Uh, they nicknamed me spaz and they would start to chant spaz, spaz, spaz. And, and I would get up and throw a desk and, and, uh, off to the, off to the principal's office, I would go and and uh, I spent a lot of time in there um, talking to counselors and and uh, the school guidance counselor, and they would show me these uh, these ink blot charts and talk to me about uh, things and and uh, I just thought to myself, gosh, if I this is just this is miserable, and I would I would be isolated from a, a lot of the kids. Uh, eventually, they would isolate me and put me in a classroom. Um, you know, by myself, and I would sit in there and uh, do my work. Okay, and it's just because they were tired of the uproars and the and the chaos that I would cause. And and uh, um, 
you know, I didn't become an alcoholic instantly, but I'll tell you, the, the family I grew up in, it was not uncommon for us to be at a uh, family function. And uh, there was there was a bar there, you know, and and uh, um, gosh, at an early age, I would go get uh, I would go get drinks for my mom. In fact, uh, at home, I would make those for her. You know, I knew how to make a rum and coke. I knew how to make a fuzzy navel, and it was not uncommon to do that. And if you're going to make it, you got to make sure it's the right right quantity of alcohol, right? You got to taste it, right? And uh, so it was not uncommon for me to do that and at, at an early age. And and uh, um, I would go up and get a drink for some for my mom or somebody, and I would get one for myself and sneak outside and and uh, go and drink that at, at an early age and. I was out with some friends uh, on a weekend, and uh, we were bored, and that committee that I have up inside my head went and got that file that said, let's get some alcohol, and I proceeded to, to mention that, and we all chipped in and, and uh, paid some exorbitant amount and got a case of beer and, and uh, um, ended up, uh, you know, once again, um, uh, the, the funny thing about that is I made sure that I got my share, okay? I got my portion. And uh, I was more than willing to have anything that you had left over as well. But um, I drank that. And once again, no real consequences as, as a result of my actions. We had a good time that night. And I think we egged some some cars and, and uh, uh, you know, did some mischievous stuff. But uh, nothing, you know, too out of the ordinary. Um, and, uh, you know, that was uh, that was just something that uh, reminded me. Um, you know, once again, that uh, that alcohol was uh, was something that always was associated with fun, and I began to do that more often. And what happened was, uh, I would sneak out I, at an early age. Um, I'm 12, 13 years old, and I'm sneaking out at night. I would go to bed, my mom would go to bed, and I would sneak out, and I would go around to different neighborhoods around the city, okay, with some other friends, and we would steal. Okay, and we would either break into your car or we could, uh, if your garage was open, I was the type of guy that, you know, if I'm sauntering down the street and your garage is open, I'm going to wander in there and see what you got. And, uh, you know, usually if you had a fridge, that meant you had some alcohol. And, and uh, um, you steal long enough, and what happens is you get caught. And uh, I ended up getting caught and put on probation. I remember I went down and saw this probation officer downtown and, and – uh, <clears throat> Went down and, and uh, saw him with my mom, and he said uh, his name was Ezra Silas, a very large man, played uh, professional football for the Los Angeles Rams, and uh, was a uh, was a very large, intimidating man, and and known all over the community as being kind of a, a real hard hard guy, and and uh, I had no idea what I was getting into, and uh, he said, Doug, I don't have time to see you today, but he said I want you to come down Friday, and you'll probably have to ride the bus because your mom can't bring you down. And I told him, I said, I'm not coming down Friday. I don't even know how to ride the bus. I said, I don't, I don't know who you think you are. And, and uh, this guy had me handcuffed and, and uh, had, uh, <clears throat> had Polk County Jail on the line uh, quicker than I could blink. And he said, I'm bringing one over. And uh, <clears throat> he hung up and I said, I can ride the bus. <clears throat> I've ridden the bus a lot of times. What time would you like me down here Friday? And uh, I quickly, quickly realized uh, what I was dealing with here. And, and uh, all I did was get sneakier at doing what I was doing. Um, you know, I, de- I was a, a paper out <laughs> delivery boy, and, and I felt bad if you were on my paper out. Um, it, uh, it just depended on what type of day it was, whether you were even going to get the paper or not. Uh, it just... <laughs> I mean, it was it was horrible, and uh, uh, I was the type of kid that I'd go around and collect from different neighborhoods I didn't even deliver to, and uh, I would go around to the city of Des Moines and knock on your door, and and uh, they'd say, "Well, you're not our paper boy," and I'd say, "Well, he's sick, and we really need to collect," and and uh, I just it was very creative, and and. Uh, not proud of that stuff. I was the type of guy that if there was any kind of telethon going on. I'm taking a coffee can and I'm writing some stuff on it and I'm out collecting for it. I'm knocking on every door and I'm collecting for a telethon, man. I'm out there, you know, doing that. Uh, I'm the type of guy that uh, um, there was a bar close by my house and and uh, um, I would go over there and I would uh, they would put all their uh, beer cans and bottles back there and I would just take enough. 
I never cleaned them out, okay, because I didn't want them, I didn't want to get too greedy to the point where they recognized it. So I would just take enough, you know, to get what I needed. And, and, uh, um, you know, it just, it was like an annuity every week. I'd go back there and, and, uh, you know, just get what I needed and, uh, um, all kinds of creative things that, uh, that I would do. And I was out one night and, uh, uh, doing what we do and, um, I found a case of beer in the back of this guy's pickup truck. And I thought, who puts a case of beer in the back of their pickup truck? But I was grateful. And uh, <laughs> I grabbed that, and, and I was on my way. I had a few, and then I took it home, and I put it underneath the bed. And I was really on super, super, super probation at this time, and, and I'd failed out of seventh grade. It's tough to, tough to pass seventh grade uh, when you don't go to seventh grade. Um, when you don't go to class. And I think about that today. My son is 12 years old and is in seventh grade. Okay. And I just can't imagine what my mom felt like at that time. You know, Doug didn't show up for school again today, you know, and, and, uh, she would get the report, the call. And, uh, it was, it was just, it was a lot of times I had the best intentions. I really did. I would show up and I would walk in the door. Okay. And I'd be like, not today, not today. And I'd just walk out and I, and I'd go do what I do, you know? And, and, uh, um, eventually, uh, what happened is I took that case of beer and I put it underneath the bed and, and, uh, I came home that next day from school cause I was on super probation and, and I'd gone to school that day and, uh, came home and, and I was excited for that case of beer and it was gone. And I was a rage came over me that day that uh, I had not felt. And uh, I remember searching around the house, and I remember finally I went up to my mom, and I, I figured she had found it and uh, had, uh, had taken it. And I, I got right in front of her, and I said, where is my case of beer? And she said, what case of beer, and why are you drinking beer? And uh, And I remember that day I got so mad that I grabbed my mom and I threw her down. And I was on top of her and I said, where is my case of beer? And uh, I remember she was scared. She was scared to death. She got in her car and she began to take off. And, and I hopped on the hood of her car and I'm pounding on her windshield as she began to take off. And I'm pounding on her windshield saying, you don't understand. You do not understand. And uh, you do stuff like that. And what happens is that starts your uh, your round of visiting institutions. Um, and... Uh, uh, I ended up getting put in a place with uh, uh, kids that uh, each morning they would carry out their bed sheets to the laundry mat, uh, to the laundry room, and and I would think, why are they doing that? And uh, and the reason why is because they were so heavily medicated that they could not get up and function at night and use the restroom. And I saw my life flash before my eyes, and I thought, that's me. That's what I'm going to end up being like. That's the story of my life. I'm going to end up being in, institutionalized for the rest of my life. And, and I would get angry and I would get upset and here would come the guys in the white coats and they would grab me and they would take me to this, this room, um, that had a microphone in the ceiling and they'd sit and I'd sit in there for hours and they'd talk to me through the microphone in the ceiling. And I was sitting there and think to myself, what is wrong with you? Why can't you be like any other kid out there? Why can't you? all I wanted was to be one among many and do what everyone else did. And shortly after, I, I would think to myself, gosh, if I could just get out of here, I could get a drink <laughs> and uh, I'd feel much better, you know, and uh, I did. Eventually, I, I there was a gal that uh, one day she was new and uh, um, she uh, she had no idea what she was doing yet. And I went up and and I was predominantly, most generally in pajamas because uh, I was always fear, fear of running. And, and I, I'd mentioned to her, I said, I got to go see my counselor. I've got a 11 o'clock uh, meeting. And, and, uh, I said, I need my clothes in that cabinet over there. And, uh, she proceeded to get those for me. And, and, uh, uh, she let me out to go see my counselor. And, and, uh, I got halfway off of the, the campus before somebody saw me and they began to chase me. And I'm going to tell you what, I felt like the fugitive, man. I was, <laughs> I was running and jumping over, leaping over fences and, and, uh, um, Every time I saw a cop car, I'd, you know, dive into the grass and, and, uh, uh, 
what ended up happening was I was uh, two weeks on the run and doing what we do, and I and I just I just basically uh, uh, tore it up and uh, found myself uh, sleeping on a couch and uh, with this gal that uh, had been up uh, on uh, uh, cocaine all night, and uh, uh, the police knocked on the door at uh, six o'clock in the morning. And uh, they had tracked me down, and and uh, they said, "Do you know a Doug Olson?" And and uh, she said, "No, Doug Olson here." And and uh, um, they said, "Who's that on the floor?" And she said, "That's Steve." They said, "Who's that on the couch?" That's Doug. And I just I thought, "You're not real bright, are you?" <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> so I proceeded to get up and grab my sack of belongings, my high V sack, and and uh, proceed to to go with them and here's the thing I was I had happened to be staying close to where my mom lived and uh um the cop car was out in front of the apartment and and uh uh as I was getting in the cop car I looked over and I saw my mom looking out the window and the disgust on her face as I was getting in the cop car one more time and I just thought oh gosh you know once again I just that that uh that guilt, that shame, that remorse, and and uh, I went back to that facility, and I'm gonna I'm gonna be honest with you guys. I really tried, I really tried to change. Okay, I really had the best intentions in the world. I did what those guys suggested. I I struggled with the uh, talking to the counselors and psychiatrists, as our book talks about. I, you know, it. Uh, I I just uh, I'm sure that they would have been able to help me had I been honest with them. Okay, but I just was unwilling to share the stuff deep down inside that was bothering me. And I just thought to myself, you have not been where I've been. Absolutely not. And uh, um, so I was just unable to 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 hurdle that and to uh, to share the stuff that was necessary to maybe find some freedom from that. And and uh, but eventually I got out of there. And I'm going to tell you, I really did. I had the I had the best intentions to change. I went back to school. My mom was living in a uh, an apartment that was attached to a big warehouse where these uh, semis would pull their trucks in. And uh, uh they would uh they would roll in off the road and and uh uh there was a fridge there with a keg on tap 24/7 and uh they, you know when they got off the road they could have a have a cool beer and uh i'm going to tell you i sat there and i hung out with my mom a lot and and uh um begin to drink uh drink the beer there and and uh, begin to do some of the things that i i uh i used to do uh and i uh, found myself coming home late one night and my mom met me at the door and here I am. I'm a ward of the state. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm not really, uh, you know, in custody of my mother yet. I'm still uh, China petition. I'm still a ward of the state. So I'm, I'm still the, you know, the, the, you know, state of Iowa's uh, child at this time. And and uh, um, I remember my mom said to me. She said, uh, uh, "You're no longer welcome here." And I looked at her, and I and I, I gave her that look. You know, and I just said, Mom, I said, I hope you know I'm never coming back. This is it. I said, I know what this world's all about. And I left, and I had no idea what this world was all about. <laughs> I began to walk. I had no clue where I was going. Um, I ended up uh, uh, finding a uh, friend uh, that uh, let me stay at his place. And, and uh, eventually what happens is because you're, you're at uh, ward of the state, they come and track you down. You, you know, they want to know what's going on. Okay. And, uh, uh, they found me and they said, uh, uh, why'd you leave home? And I said, my mom's a bad alcoholic. I can't live with her. And, uh, they believed me. They believed me. And, uh, what ended up happening was this family that I'd stayed with a couple of days. They decided to go and become a foster family, took classes. They had no idea what they were getting into. Absolutely no idea the tornado that was about ready to run through their lives. No clue. Um, long story short is I went through treatment one more time with that family. And, uh, and I used all the way through treatment. I graduated. The day I graduated, I was high. You know? And it just, it, uh, you know, the, the tests were not that sophisticated back then. So you could, uh, you know, you could drink a gallon of water and, 
<laughs> and uh, I was at the uh, the herbal store, the the uh, whatever it was. The oh, you go buy all kinds of stuff uh, that uh, golden root seal and things like. Yeah, just I found myself doing all kinds of gimmicks to try and pass those UAs, and somehow did, and and uh, got through that treatment, and and uh, you know it's. Uh, um, had no intention of staying sober and, and I was living with this family still. And, and, uh, one morning I had some, uh, I had a friend bringing some stuff over at this time. I was, I was, uh, uh dealing, thought I was big stuff and, and, uh, man, I had all kinds of big deals going on and, and, uh, had a, a friend coming over, bringing some stuff over and had some other friends stop over and they said, Hey man, we got a couple cases of beer and we're heading to the ledges and, uh, let's go. And I said, ah, I'm going to hang out here at home and, and, uh, uh, I'll catch up with you guys a, a little bit later on this evening. And uh, they said, well, maybe your foster sister would like to go. And uh, she decided to go. And uh, we were we were good drinking buddies. We drank a lot together. And she said, hey, I'll be home later. We'll get a bottle. And, and uh, uh, we'll go get a, our, our deal was to get a bottle of 10 high. And, and uh, we it was going to make it a 10 high night. And uh, um, about 6.30, I was down in my mood room down there listening to my music, my mood music, doing what I do, and, and uh, got a call, and it was the sheriff. He said, there's been a bad accident. You need to get down to the hospital right away. And uh, we proceeded to go down there, and, and what had happened was my my uh, foster sister was in a uh, uh, with uh, uh, two of my friends, and they were driving, and they, uh, uh, they'd been drinking all day, and, and uh, they ran a stop sign doing about 80 out on a, uh, a farm road and hit a van uh, that had a, uh, a man in it uh, that had a, uh, uh, a family, a, a wife and a, a children of three, killed the man. And uh, um, and uh, my foster sister uh, was thrown from the car and, and hit her head on the concrete and was in a coma. And I want to tell you, um, the guilt and the shame set in quick, and, and uh, I began to drink uh uh, like no other and take, uh, I was, uh, I found some pills and was taking those and codeine cough syrup. And I was just an absolute wreck and, uh, landed myself, uh, one more time in treatment. And, uh, this time I'd been removed from the house. Okay. So I'm no longer welcome there, obviously. And, and, uh, um, I'm in treatment inpatient and uh, went through there and, and uh, got out and, and went to Alcoholics Anonymous for a short period of time and sat around the outside edges looking in. And I thought, yeah, I'm too young. I haven't done what that guy's done, you know, and, and uh, um, this sponsor thing. It, who knows what that is? And, and these, you know, I just it it just did not appeal to me whatsoever and and uh, i got a call from a gal that i had met in treatment and she needed some help and uh, i went over and helped her and and the uh, next thing you know um gosh i was drunk and uh, uh found myself sleeping from place to place doing the things we do wherever i could possibly sleep um gosh i found some real creative places that you can sleep it's amazing uh, apartment hall hallways uh laundry uh, laundry rooms and apartment buildings. Um, uh, hell, I went over to, uh, Charles gave us forward one day down on Merle Hay and, and, uh, there was a semi truck there that, uh, they were selling and, and, uh, had a sleeper in it. And I just, I thought, hmm, maybe the door's open. And I grabbed that and the door was, door was unlocked. And, and, uh, I was able to get up in there, I had a mattress and, uh, and the radio even worked. And I mean, you can find all kinds of places to, to lay your head if you need to. Um, if people eventually, which is my case, they would get sick of me and run me off and say, you gotta, you gotta get out of here. You gotta get off my couch. You gotta go, you know? And, and, uh, what ended up happening was I, uh, I found myself physically drunk and I had, uh, two Budweiser's and a joint left and probably could have pushed myself over the edge like we do. Okay. But for some reason, I had that moment of clarity, and I just I thought, man, what is going on? I just could not seem to shut off the the uh, the head. I could not seem to shut off the madness. And and uh, like I said, I probably could have if I would have drank the rest of that beer and smoked that joint. But 
for some reason this night, I, I just uh, I could not seem to shut it off. And this guy I was with, he had been to Alcoholics Anonymous before. He says, you need to call AA. And he gave me a phone number of a guy to call. And for some reason that night, I had the desperation of a drowning man. And I picked up the phone and I called this guy. And this guy got me on the phone with his sponsor. And his sponsor said, Doug, I want you to go down to Beth Mission and get your room and call me in the morning. And I said to him, I said, I'm not going to Beth Mission. I said, I'll find a place to stay. And uh, I was scared to death. Going to Beth Mission? Holy cow. I mean, that's for real, you know. And uh, I just thought, uh, I am not going to the Bethel Mission. And uh, I said, uh, I will find a place to stay. And I think he realized, he said, uh, he had a short opportunity to grab hold of me. He said, he said, better yet, he said, why don't you come to my place? And 20 minutes later, there was a carload of guys that snatched me up and took me from Des Moines and drove me to Ames. And I remember driving up there, and, and, and these guys were laughing and having a good time, and I just thought to myself, gosh, if this doesn't work out, it's going to be a long walk back. And uh, <laughs> um, it, uh, and we knocked on the door, and this large, intimidating man answered the door. And, and uh, what this guy told me was what no judge, no probation officer, no counselor, no psychiatrist, nobody had ever told me. Okay? He sat me down, and he said, Doug, he said, you never have to be lonely or take a drink again as long as you live if you don't want to. And I thought about that. I thought, gosh, you know, yeah. Yeah, when I drank, I ended up getting arrested for assault charges. All kinds of crazy things happen, and and uh, and uh, I'm tired. I'm lonely. I'm lonely. I hadn't talked to my mom but for a brief instance on the phone here or there because I was bound and determined to show her, okay? I told her that I was never coming back again, right? So... I was bound and determined to show her. So when we talked, it was for a brief moment, okay? And uh, it was just on the phone and uh, for a couple of years. And and uh, um, and I, I hadn't eaten anything decent. I hadn't slept anywhere decent. And I was wearing the same clothes I'd been wearing for some time. And, and uh, he said, Doug, he said, if alcohol is your problem, you're in the wrong place. And I looked at him and I said, what do you mean by that? That's goofy. I said, I'm an alcoholic. He said, yeah. He said, but you can't seem to deal with what life throws at you every day down the pipe. And if you don't find a solution for that, he said, you'll go back to the only solution you've ever known, and that's to take a drink. And he says, the only thing I've ever found that's worked has been this thing called Alcoholics Anonymous. And he showed me the big book. And he says, you can have that if you want it. And I remember him going to bed. He grabbed a mattress, and he threw it on the floor, and, and he went off to bed, and and uh, he said, you can, he said, you can sleep on my floor. And, and, uh, and I remember laying down and, and I uh, just, I said, the only prayer I've ever known that's, I just, I said, God help me. And I, and I just went to sleep. And I remember that next morning he kicked the mattress and he said, it's time to go. And I said, what do you want me to do? Where do I go? And he handed me this big sack full of, uh, uh, cans. And he said, I want you to take this sack of cans down the quick shop down the road here. He said, there's a uh, college beauty school over here gives $3 haircuts. He said, I want you to go get yourself a haircut. You look like a bum. He said, you got a week to find a job. You're out of here. I had hair down the middle of my back and, and uh, you know, wore Harley T-shirts. I'd never ridden a Harley, but I <clears throat> I was cool. Um, I, didn't, I couldn't tell you what a Harley was if, if, uh, if I saw one, but it... Uh, but I had a Harley t-shirt and, uh, and he said, I get home at five thirty. you can get back in. And he locked the door and he got in his car and he drove off to work. And for the first time in my life, I turned in and looked out at a world I knew nothing about without drinking alcohol and doing drugs. And I thought to myself, I thought, I oh, sure way life's been working real well. You might want to try what this guy suggested. He'd been sober for 10 years. And, and, uh, so I, Took them cans down to the quick shop, turned them in, and, and I went over to that college beauty school and got a got that uh, three dollar haircut. And I started looking for my big career in Ames that day. And and uh, I remember coming back to his place at uh, five thirty, and he was home. And I walked in, and and uh, he handed me a white shirt and tie. And I said, "Oh, here we go. What's this got to do with staying sober?" And he said, "Just put it on." So I put the white shirt on, and, and uh, I said, I don't know how to tie a tie. I've never wore a tie. So he stood behind me for the next hour in, in the back of me in a mirror and, and taught me how to tie a tie. And I said, what do I do with this? What do you want me to wear this for? 
He said, you wear this tomorrow when you go look for a job. I said, how do I get a job? He said, you make a full-time job getting a full-time job. You put eight applications in for an eight-hour day. You go in and talk to the manager, okay? Don't talk to the guy at the counter because you may be taking his job. (laughs) He may throw your application in the trash. So you go in and you talk to the manager. He said, this will give you a leg up, make you look better. I'm so glad, so grateful that I had a guy that gave me some direction, okay? And didn't, uh, the day I woke up, okay, from that mattress that first day, didn't say, what are you going to do today? You just going to hang around the house here or, you know? Because he would have killed me. Would have absolutely killed me. And uh, so I, we went to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous that night, and I remember walking in, and he said, I want you to go around the room and shake everybody's hand and tell them who you are and what you're doing here. And, and uh, I walked around the room and said, I'm the I'm alcoholic first meeting. And, and uh, they smiled. I thought they were laughing at me, and they got me a cup of coffee and sat me down and welcomed me. And, and uh, we begin this journey. And, and uh, what this guy did for me was he began to spoon feed me Alcoholics Anonymous. He began to take me through the book. And, and on Wednesday nights, all the guys he sponsored would come over and we would sit down and we'd quietly read the book. Okay. And, uh, just depending on where you were. And there was a big dictionary that sat on the middle of the floor. And if you ran into a word you didn't understand, you got the dictionary open and you looked it up. Okay, and then at the end of the night, if it was your night, you would get together with him and you would do some step work with him. And then the highlight of the evening was we would order pizza pit pizza. And uh, that was that was big stuff. I'm telling you, because I was living on a a pretty tight budget at that time. And and, uh, I was working at uh, Burger King. I'd found my big job working at Burger King. And and I remember coming home with my first check and my sponsor said, "Okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to learn a little bit about being self-supporting through our own contributions. He says, here's what I get for rent. And we're going to the grocery store. Here's what you've got left. And uh, I'm going to tell you what. Um, I could write a book on uh, 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 different recipes for ramen noodles. Uh, And if you are out there and you need some help with some recipes for ramen noodles, you come see me after the meeting because there is all kinds of ways to doctor those things up. And uh, on a good day, you could get uh, seven of those for a buck uh, over at Save You More. And uh, uh, so... He was real good about that stuff, and and uh, uh, so pizza bit pizza on Wednesday nights was the highlight, man. I'm telling you, it was big stuff, and and uh, uh, he uh, that's how I ended up doing my inventory. He ended up uh, uh, saying I could no longer participate in the Wednesday night, uh, you know, a big book study and pizza fest if I didn't finish my inventory. So he locked me in his bedroom until I got it done. So. Um, Eventually, uh, uh, you know, what I, what was happening was I was working at Burger King and, and going to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'm going to tell you, I wasn't very coordinated yet. And uh, I'm working there, and uh, uh, it's a college town, and it just gets crazy busy at uh, at lunchtime. And, and uh, any people work at Burger King out there? Come on. All right. We got a few. Okay. So I was the guy that was in charge of putting the meat in the machine and it would go through the flame broiler on the, and come out on the other side. And, and, uh, so they'd call back Whopper and I'd have to put in a piece of meat and they'd call back double cheeseburger, put in two pieces of meat. And, and, uh, I'm going to tell you at lunchtime in Ames in a college town, it gets crazy and they're calling back Whopper, Whopper, double cheeseburger, Whopper, cheeseburger. And I just could not keep up. I was, I, I mean, it was a mess and there was, there was meat piling up on the other side and, and, uh, um, I grabbed one piece of meat and it fell on the floor and, and, uh, heck I picked it right up off the floor and put it on the bun and gave it to the guy in front of me and the manager came over and he said, you're fired. And, uh, I'm three and a half months sober and, uh, um, I've got my Burger King uniform on i smell like a french fry and it was the longest walk i'd ever had from there to my sponsor's house and uh, i remember walking in and and uh sat down and i i just looked at him and i said where do you go when you get fired from burger king (laughs) and uh, he was always so positive he said it's time for change and uh (laughs) he sent me back to des moines and i didn't think you'd get any lower than burger king but i found it 
I did. I ran into a guy at the coastal gas station that night when I came back and I said, hey, I'm looking for a job. And he said, great. He said, uh, meet me out at the racetrack, Prairie Meadows racetrack at 630 in the morning. And I got out there and he handed me a pitchfork and a shovel. He said, why don't you clean all these stalls? And uh, that became my job for the next uh, six months to a year. And, and uh, this uh, this trainer, this horse trainer, he would come and he'd, I was living in a one bedroom apartment there with a guy in AA. He slept in the, in the bedroom and I would sleep on his couch and I would rent a couch from him. And this horse trainer would come each morning and he'd honk the horn and, and I'd come running out and hop in his truck and he always had a cup of coffee for me and a roll. And uh, we'd go and, and uh, do the work and at the end of the day, he'd always pay me cash. Here's the amazing thing about that, okay? Is, uh, I was living in Altoona, which is, uh, uh, a 15, 20 minute drive from here. Every night, somebody would drive from Des Moines to come pick me up and take me to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And my sponsor would always, he'd, he'd taught me how to be self supporting. Okay? So I would, I would always offer money. I would always offer trying to give them something. And they would say, you know what, Doug, there'll come a, come a day when you'll have the opportunity to do that for somebody else. And we expect you to do it. And uh, they would uh, they would give me rides and they would get me to uh, to the retreat and to the White House conference. And and uh, um, I remember one night they came out there to pick me up and and I said, guys, I would I, I hadn't called them that night. OK. And uh, for a ride and they showed up and they said, we're here to get you for the meeting. And I said, oh, I wouldn't plan on going tonight. They said, look, we drove all the way out here to get you. Get in the car. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, okay. I'm going to the meeting. <laughs> so we went to the meeting that night. And uh, about that time, there was a group starting here in Des Moines uh, called the Des Moines Fox Hall Group. And I got the opportunity to be a part of that, starting that group. And it was a group that was based on strong sponsorship and, and uh, um, uh you know, uh, uh, we had a, uh, it's right over here on Thursday night, still going today. We just celebrated our 25th anniversary. And uh, um, it's a speaker's meeting. It meets on Thursday night at 1001 Pleasant at uh, uh, 8 o'clock. And uh, we have a beginner's meeting at 715. Uh, if you come there, um, I can I can assure you uh, that uh, uh, that group is, is alive and well. And, and the uh, we are there carrying the message. Okay, to the alcoholic and still suffers. Uh, you walk in and there's greeters at the door. Uh, we have, a, like I said, a beginner's meeting. We recognize the new person. Uh, we have literature. And uh, um, you're going to hear a couple good speakers. And if you don't, uh, come back the following week. There will be two more speakers. So, And uh, we celebrate birthdays. And, and uh, it's, it's just been a, a great thing for me. And I've, I've served about as, in every capacity of that group. Uh, that you can possibly do with the exception of uh, secretary and the treasurer up until this year. I think they were just concerned about giving me the money aspect of it up until this year. But I took on the treasurer duty this year, and, and uh, that's, been, uh, that's been amazing. That's been fun. But I've been the GSR. I've been the intergroup. I've been you name it. I've done it all. The butt picker, the literature guy, the grapevine. Uh, I've done it all. And it, uh, it's been a, been a great part of my recovery. And uh, if you do not have a home group, okay, um, I suggest you get one. Uh, it is absolutely uh, the thing that has uh, saved my bacon um, more than I can count. Uh, you know, when because uh, because Alcoholics Anonymous affords me the opportunity today to participate in the game of life doesn't mean that I'm not going to deal with the stuff that comes down the pipe. I'm just able to shoulder that today. Okay, one day at a time without taking a drink. That's all. Okay, and my good friend John says you can't get spiritually ready overnight. Okay, you cannot wake up and try and get down on your knees and get spiritually ready. Okay, it's just not going to happen. Okay, so I've got to be on the move. I've got to be doing all the time because I never know what's coming down the pipe. I just don't. Okay, um, got off on a little tangent there. Sorry. Uh, I ended up uh, 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 moving to Des Moines, and I uh, walked by this grocery store, 
at 42nd University. I thought, gosh, if I could get a job there, I'd work there the rest of my life. <laughs> Those guys are clean cut. They wear a shirt and tie, and they're nice and friendly, and it, uh, it was much better than shoveling crap for a living out at the racetrack. Um, so I went in there and asked the manager and he said, Oh, we're, we're not hiring right now. And, and I put in my application and I called him every day after that. My sponsor said, call him every day. So I called him every day after that until he said, all right, he said, I'm gonna give you a shot. Come on in. And, uh, he, he hired me. I ended up, uh, you know, you're looking at a guy that never finished high school at that time, you know, uh, you know, and, and I ended up uh, working my way up running a six man crew, becoming a night shift manager and, and, uh, you know, and, and running that facility. And it was absolutely incredible. And, and, uh, at that time I met a gal in Alcoholics Anonymous and, and, uh, um, I began to talk to my sponsor about that. And, and, uh, I said to him, I said, uh, um, I'd like to ask Ashley out. And he said, I think that's a great idea. He said, why don't you go ask her sponsor? And I thought, Oh gosh, I do not want to do that. She knew my track record. Uh, that's the last thing I wanted to do was go ask her sponsor. But obviously I wanted what she had and was willing to go to any link. <clears throat> so I sauntered over there and asked her sponsor if I could ask her out. And, and, uh, I'm going to tell you, uh, she, she says she didn't do this, but she says, I suppose. And, uh, um, we went out on our first date and I remember calling my sponsor and I said, I have no idea what to do on this date. And he said, well, you're both alcoholic. Why don't you go to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous? Okay. So we went on a walk. We met at the Capitol. We went on a walk and then we went to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous and that was our first date. And, uh, uh, I didn't call her the next week. I didn't talk to her on the phone for two and a half hours, okay? Um, I didn't instantly throw away all my commitments and jump on in, okay? Frankly, I I didn't talk to her again, okay? She came and looked me up at my home group two and a half months later and said, hey, I really enjoyed that. Would you like to do it again sometime? And uh, we started dating, and we started, you know, and and, uh, long story short, we dated for three, three and a half years, something like that, and... and, uh, uh, we just celebrated 21 years of marriage. Um, so thank you for that. And, and she's a, she's a solid individual, solid AA member. So, so grateful for, for her in my life. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I, I obviously wanted to, uh, have something to bring to the table. And I told my sponsor, I said, you know, I don't have anything really to offer to this gal. And, and, uh, he said, why don't you go get your GED? And, uh, so I went out and started taking classes on how to get my GED and, and, uh, ended up getting that. And I, I remember him saying, why don't you take some basic classes out there and, and, uh, at the college. So I signed up for some classes like how to study and basic arithmetic. And, and, uh, uh, next thing you know, I'm, I'm getting a two year degree and, uh, and, uh, yeah, I mean, just, just incredible, you know, and, and, uh, we got married and, and had the classic AA wedding and, and, uh, you know, it's uh, a bajillion people there and, and, uh, uh, you know, it's just, a just, a uh, one of the most beautiful days of my life. I'll never forget it. And, and, uh, um, Moved up to Ames, and, and I remember she graduated from Iowa State a couple years later, and, and uh, we got a letter. We were living in marriage student housing and, and uh, got a letter in the, in the mail that said, hey, uh, somebody has got to be going to school at Iowa State, or you've got to move out of marriage student housing. Oh, okay. And uh, so she had graduated, so it was time to kind of make a decision. And, and uh, so I decided to go back to school, and, and uh, um, I was just scared to death to do stuff like that. You know, I walked into that uh, first class, Western Civ, and I remember there was three, 400 kids in there. And I'm, all, I'm this older guy that's in there with these, these kids, and, and I just thought to myself, what am I doing here? I just once again fell out of place. But I took, okay, what you guys taught me is show up, okay, show up early, okay, do what you say you're going to do. Ask questions if you need it. And uh, it's amazing what can happen. And, you know, I, so what? I had to hire a tutor to get through business calculus, but <laughs> that's okay. I paid him 10 bucks an hour. He said, forget everything the teacher said. Here's what we're going to do. And uh, <clears throat> glad for that. Um, but I ended up uh, getting a, a degree from Iowa State. And I remember the day I walked across that stage. And, uh, I looked across Hilton Coliseum and I was able to see my mom over there. Neither my brother and I had graduated. So it, it, I looked across there and saw, saw, uh, 
my mom and, and the proud look on her face. And it was just, it was priceless. It was absolutely priceless and uh, worth all its weight in gold and all the time and effort. And, and uh, um, I don't know how long I've talked, but I did not check. But I'm going to wrap this up. I'm going to tell you a few things uh, in my life today. Okay, real quick. Um, Ashley and I are married in 2003. We uh, had a son, Jack. And I told you that my dad left when I was two and a half. And uh, he had never been a part of my life. And uh, I was scared to death. I, I had no idea how to be a father. And I remember calling my sponsor from the hospital. And I said, Bobby, I said, uh, I said, I don't know how to be a father. I'm scared to death. And uh, he said, Doug, he said, you can't fail if you treat that kid as God's kid. And if you do that, you cannot fail. And uh, that's been my experience. That kid is an amazing kid. Um, nothing like I am, that's for sure. Um, he is. Uh, uh, we got a letter this uh, this last semester that uh, he got. Uh, he's he's one of a hundred kids uh, that got chosen to be uh, be in Central Academy at seventh grade. And uh, I'm going to tell you, that's not Doug Olson. That is not me. And uh, um, I get the opportunity to be a part of his life today and, and uh, uh, be a part of his athletics. Um, I've, I've helped coach uh, his uh, football, his basketball, his his uh, his baseball, and, and uh, I'm a horrible basketball player. But uh, I was a pretty good ball player when I was a kid. And, uh, but, uh, I was not a very good football player. And, and I remember, uh, uh, I showed up to the practice and one of the coaches said, we need some volunteers and nobody raised their hand. And so I, I stepped up and I scared to death. I knew nothing about football. And I called my good friend, Kelly, um, who was a state football player that's in, uh, part of my home group and I said hey man I said I've got this playbook it's about uh, about an inch and a half thick and I said it's all Chinese to me I said can you come over and he said you bet man he came over and we set up cones in the backyard and this guy spent two three hours with me uh, teaching me uh, all about football and I got the opportunity to participate and uh, be in the game with my son and uh be on the sideline. In 2005, um, uh, you see, I'd, I'd I'd made amends to my mom. I, you know, the amends. I, I did a lot of amends. It was uh, I remember going through the process with with my sponsor, and and uh, my sponsor and I uh, went through that uh, that list. And and uh, he said, Doug, you've stole from a lot of people. He said, We have no idea who those people are. So here's what we're gonna do. And uh, we assigned some charities that I was going to uh, give to every year. And then he says, one of the other things I want you to do is he says, every meeting you go to, I want you to drop $2 in and $4 at your home group. And at that time, I was working at the grocery store making making peanuts, you know. And I just I, and I was going to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous every day. And I just thought to myself, I thought, there is absolutely no way I'm going to be able to do this. And uh, he said, I'll tell you when I want you to quit. And uh, um, I started doing that. And the amazing thing about that is I've never really had any issues with money since I've done that. I don't know why that is, okay, but I've just not had any issues with that since I've been doing that. And he's not told me when to quit. Yeah. So, so I just keep doing that. Okay. Um, but you know, and it was easy for me to go around and, and pay the, the convenience stores and, you know, walk in and say, Hey, I stole the case of beer from you. You know, here's, here's, uh, here's for that case of beer and another one. And, and, uh, is there anything else I could do to make that right? And in the, the Des Moines register going down and meeting with the CFO down there and, and her looking at me like, you want to do what you want to pay? You want to send me a check because you went around and collected from, what? And she just didn't quite grasp grasp the idea, but she, you know, I went down and met with her and I paid that back. And, and But here's the man that was the hardest. 
is my mom because I'd told her that I was never coming back, you see, and I'd hurt her so bad. I'd done so many things, and, and uh, I remember she had moved to Dallas to take a, a job with Greyhound. She was really excited, and she moved down there, and, and uh, she took a job down there, and I went down and and helped her move, and, and uh, um, the last day, of course, procrastinated till the last day, and I sat down with my mom, and my mom said, you know, I told her all this stuff. I said that I wasn't the son that uh, that I wanted to be, and in in a general way, I told her the stuff that I'd done and that I was wrong. And I asked her what I could do to make that right. And she looked at me and she said, "Doug, all I've ever wanted for you is to be happy, and to be my son." And I remember calling my sponsor, and he said, "Great. Here's what we're gonna do." He said, "Whenever you call your mom and you talk to her, whenever you're around her, you're always happy." He said, God knows you burdened her enough with all your problems, so no more. He said, whenever you call her, you're always talking to her about the good stuff going on in your life. And, and uh, she ended up moving back here, and, and uh, she loved Alcoholics Anonymous because it gave her her kids back, you see. And uh, I remember my first Thanksgiving with her. My first, uh, my first holidays were with the people in Alcoholics Anonymous because I was not allowed yet to go spend that with my family. And uh, I remember I, I spent that with Denny C., my first Thanksgiving with him. And, uh, um, but I, I remember the, the Thanksgiving, the first Thanksgiving I had with her sober, and, and uh, she, uh, it was about 6.30, and she said, well, I suppose you should be getting off to the meeting. It was my home group night. And uh, she just became accustomed to that. So we would eat dinner at uh, at a certain time of day that would allow us to be able to get to our home group. And she just loved Alcoholics Anonymous. And I got a call in 2005, and and it was uh, it was the hospital. My mom had suffered from acute pancreatitis, and she really struggled. Every year, a couple times a year, she would go into the hospital for a uh, a bout of. Uh, pancreatitis and it was just like clockwork i mean it was you know and that's a extremely painful uh thing to go through she would just sit there and dry heave and it was it was just it was horrible and uh um this time was different i went down there i just suspected it was uh, the same thing and got down there and my mom was fighting for her life she'd had a heart attack and uh um ended up happening was she was out too long and and uh uh, uh my in praying about it and talking to my sponsor, uh, she was never going to be any better than what she was. And uh, they were able to revive her, but she just was never going to be any better. And, and uh, uh, my brother and I, we decided to uh, donate her organs. And uh, I remember that day I uh, um, I said to my brother and I were in the room and, and the surgeon came in and we were talking and I asked him, I said, would it be okay for me to go into the operating room with you? Because when they when they when they pull the plug, they you know, and the person uh, takes their last breath, they immediately start harvesting the organs, and uh, so that they can they can get those. And and uh, um, and the doctor said, "Well, nobody's done that, but if you want to do that, sure. I don't see anything wrong with that." And uh, I was able to go into the uh, to the operating room with my brother and my wife and be with my mom and hand her off to her creator and be with her when she took her last breath and she didn't have to be alone. And uh, I'm so grateful for that. That's Alcoholics Anonymous at its finest, okay, that uh, I get to participate. If I'm drinking, I'm not there. I'm not in it, man. I am not in it, okay? Five years ago, right around this time, My wife had taken uh, her great aunt to the hospital or to the doctor. Uh, She had developed breast cancer at uh, 80-something years old, and uh, which old people do. It's what it is. And and, uh, my wife came home and and, uh, decided to give herself a self-examination and found a lump and was fortunate enough that she was going in the next week to uh, uh to see the doctor and so she went in and and uh they said oh it's probably nothing but we should probably check it out so uh they did a test and and uh, found out uh, my wife had breast cancer now, i'm going to tell you guys that uh you cannot get spiritually ready as my good friend john good says overnight okay 
Alcoholics Anonymous because I'm in the center of Alcoholics Anonymous, okay, and not on the outside edges. What happened was AA rallied around us, okay, and uh, uh, we had enough food in the freezer, I'm not kidding you, to feed us for like the next year. And uh, we had uh, we had people coming over, bringing meetings to my wife while she went through uh, chemo after the surgery and everything. And, and uh, uh, we're uh, blessed. She'll celebrate uh, uh, five years cancer-free here this, this next month. So grateful for that. And, and uh, um, I, uh, I got to wrap it up, but I'm, I'm going to tell you uh, two quick stories, okay? Um, two quick stories, and I'm done. Serious. I, serious. Serious. Okay. Uh, I told you that I never met my father. He left when I was two and a half, okay? Six months ago, I got a call from my uncle who I friended 20-plus uh, years ago. Okay, he came and looked up my mom and said, "Hey, I'd like to meet uh, meet your kids," and uh, uh, I went and had a cup of coffee with him, sat down, and we we built a friendship and got to know each other and and built a good friendship. And he called me about six months ago and he says, "Hey, your father called me," and he said, uh, "He said he's trying to clean up some stuff," and uh, with with uh, with me, and he said, "If." Uh, if you ever want to meet him, now would be the time. It appears that he has cancer. And uh, I thought about it, and, and uh, I happen to represent, I'm a, I'm a lighting salesman, and I happen to represent a factory in, in San Francisco. And my father uh, happened to live in Oakland. And uh, so I, uh, I arranged a factory trip to take some clients out there, and I took some clients out and, and uh, went and, and uh, uh, did that and then uh, took a couple extra days and, and uh, was able to go uh, uh, meet my father and uh, sit down and spend two days with him um, talking. And uh, what an amazing experience. What an amazing experience. Um, what I realized quickly is that my father uh, did not have the capability of being a father. Uh, he was homeless till he was until 1981. Um, so there's just no way that he could have even been a father if he wanted to be a father. And uh, uh, I learned a lot about him. And uh, uh, I'm not saying our relationship is, is the most wonderful thing, but, hey, it's a start. And uh, I'm just grateful I've got the opportunity to meet the guy once in my life. Uh, uh, the day I left, I took a long look at him and was able to give him a hug. I don't know if it'll be the last time I ever see him. I have no idea. So... All things are possible with Alcoholics Anonymous. They are. The last story I'll share with you is near and dear to my heart. It's uh, at two and a half years sober, I was doing things that I wasn't even doing when I was drinking. I was living a life that was full of lies and, and shame and remorse. And, and uh, I was just, uh, I was taking poor actions. And my sponsor, I, the nice thing is I would tell on myself, and my sponsor, okay, would say, Doug, when the pain becomes great enough, you'll quit taking that action. You'll quit doing that, okay? And uh, I remember I was with him at the first Worldwide Bridge in the Gap conference over here on the south side, and, and uh, it was held here. And uh, um, I was talking to him once again about something, and he said, Doug, I'm tired of talking to you about that. Why don't you go talk to that old timer over there? And I walked over, and it was it was Dick M. from Bellevue, Nebraska. And I went over, and I waited for him to acknowledge my presence. And he said, "Hey, Doug, how are you?" And and uh, I immediately went into to how I felt like I'd been given a raw deal, and how miserable my life was, and how this and that and blah blah blah. And and uh, he looked at me and he said, "Hmm." He said, the answer to your problem is to sponsor five guys, and he walked off. And I thought, screw you, pal. I don't have time to sponsor one guy, let alone five. And I trotted off all resentful and uh, come over to a meeting over here at the White House the next week, and, and uh, this tall kid with long hair and the biggest feet you'd ever seen, uh, he came over and asked me to sponsor him. And uh, he had his huge feet. We nicknamed him Sasquatch. And uh, Sasquatch would call me. We go in the meeting? 
yeah, I'll be over to pick you up like it was some inconvenience. You know, here we go. Go pick him up. And we'd go to the meeting. And you see, I was to the point in my life where I, I don't know if it was, I just couldn't handle success. And I just, you know, I liked that turmoil. I liked that crazy. So I was used to that. I liked to create stuff. And, and uh, um, during the Lord's Prayer, it was not uncommon for me to look and see where my sponsor was. Okay, because right after the meeting, I'm heading over there. I got big deals to talk about. I got, I need some time right now. And uh, what happened is this night here at the White House, okay, uh, my classic Lord's Prayer, during the Lord's Prayer, I find my sponsor, and uh, we close, and I start beelining over to see him. And out of the corner of my eye, here comes this guy, and it's Sasquatch. And he cuts me off. And he starts talking to me about the stuff going on in his life. And what happens for me that night is what happens for all of us if we're willing to do it is the magic happened. By the time I got done talking to Sasquatch, my sponsor had gone home for the night. And the things that I seemed to be struggling with seemed rather rather trivial. Okay. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.